Hi, it's me, Del Singh from Late Night Banter. Trust you're enjoying the banter at latenightbanter.com. Remember, there's loads there, shows you might have missed, and other things that are coming up. But in the meantime, I saw an advert for the Great Garden Bird Watch, or the Great British Bird Watch, so you watch wildlife in your garden. I was in London last week and I actually thought I twigged on the Great British Beard Watch because beards are everywhere. It's brilliant. I mean, as a Sikh, I've been rocking beards, well, ever since. And there was a time when loads of top people had beards. Jesus, Abraham Lincoln, Charles Darwin, giant haystacks. But then they kind of like faded out. But they're back. All sorts of beards, hipster beards. And in fact, I was actually in Shoreditch, which is hipster beard capital. I did a little report. So check out my report on the beard. Run VT. Hi, this is Del Singh from Late Night Banter. I'm actually at the Ace Hotel in Shoreditch. I mean, this place, trendy. I mean, okay, if you suffer from hay fever, you don't want to be in this place. This is just a reception. There's more flowers here than a crematorium. But seriously, you know, the thing that's actually more abundant than the flowers here, the beards, the beards. You know what, I remember a time in the 80s when the only people that had a beard was Richard Branson and the Yorkshire Ripper, and my dad, of course. And now I've got one of them. But honestly, you can't move for beards around here. Look at these dudes behind me here. Stop laughing, guys. Look, come on. These guys, these guys have got, these guys have got, Great beard, this guy's even got a pen in his beard. Come on, don't leave home without it. So listen, the beard is back. So, you know, you don't just have to be the seek to have a beard. Beards are cool. Anyway, enough of that. Let banter commence. Hello, good evening and welcome to Late Night Banter with me, Del Singh. My guest this evening is Hadial Dinsa, and Hadial is the Police and Crime Commissioner for Derbyshire. Hadial, good to meet you. And you as well, Del. And I guess the first thing I've got to ask you is, uh, I was asked to ask you this, was as Crime Commissioner, do you have a big light up on the roof there in order to get Batman or any other superhero? Uh, like Commissioner Gordon. Like Commissioner Gordon. Unfortunately, not. Ah. I am working on it, though. Okay, that's that's encouraging. That's always encouraging. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, Derbyshire needs a guy with his underpants on outside to be sorting out crime. <laughs> we all do. But yeah. no, thank you very much for answering that and so on. And that, that was that was from my son. So he told me to ask that one. So there you go, Henry. That's for you. Um, so just very quickly, you your background, you, you're born in Punjab, but you've been in Derbyshire since about 1967? 67, yeah, when yeah. I was about nine and a half years old. Okay, yeah. so and so coming over at about nine and a half years old, huge change, I, I'd yeah. imagine? Massive, massive change. I was, I came here with my brother, my mum, mm -hmm. uh, my father was already here. Okay. And uh, I didn't know any English. Right. I think I knew the th A, B, C, and that's about it. Okay. Well, there's still and, some uh, people out there. Yeah. After all these years, is just about know that. So yeah, you've done I, well. I, I can do A, B, C, D now. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> that's an improvement. That's pretty good. Good going. And so, uh, you know, but your roots now, I guess, are firmly in Derby because you've been here so long. Yeah. I suppose uh, it's old Derbyshire, I should yeah. say. And. Um, but do you still have connections back in India? And yeah, do you tend yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I've got my cousins in in, uh, in the in, in the Punjab, okay. in Aspen, where I come from. Okay. Um, I don't go back as much as I should do, but I, I do have relatives there and connections. And mm. uh, my mum goes regularly every year, and she was always asking me to go. But uh, if I go every three or four years, I'm mm. doing well. You're doing pretty good. Yeah. That, that, that's okay. And in, when you obviously living, studying in, in the UK uh, and doing all those good things. I believe you went to university, did psychology? Yeah, yeah, Bangor University uh, in Bangor. North Wales. Oh, okay, you didn't develop an accent or something? You no, were there long no, enough. I didn't. I, I'm not very good at uh, picking up accents wherever I go. Okay, okay, that's pretty good. And I mean, what was it with the psychology thing that actually interested you? Because it, it was obviously something, was there something that sort of triggered it in you that, oh, this yeah, sounds interesting? Yeah, yeah, when I was, it's one of those things, you, you never know what you want to do when you're sure. uh, at school. And, that age, um, yeah. You, something grabs you. And I, I, mm. Initially, it was, it was a, um, a competition between agriculture 
okay. in psychology. Agriculture, because I thought, I know it's a strange thing, but uh, okay. uh, I used to think, well, I'm coming from a farming family yeah. uh, in, in, in the village, and I uh, thought maybe I can do something about uh, improving agricultural potential of our family in India. So oh, okay. agriculture. Oh, that's very noble. But it uh, soon went out of my mind, and psychology was something that I've always been interested in. People, Which is pretty much behavior. in your mind. Yeah, yeah okay. And um, to see how I can understand better human nature, particularly with all the stuff that's going on with people. Okay. Not always doing the right thing. Okay. So, uh, so I just prompt for psychology. Psychology, then. and and once you'd kind of like gone down that road of psychology, when you sort of came out of university, you wanted to practice that. That you did that yeah, in, yeah. through the in the NHS. You, like yeah, yeah. Well, originally, it's it's funny how things go. Mm. You never end up where you want to be, right? Or you intend to be. Sounds and like a bad uh, sat nav. I mean, yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> the same way. I mean, I wanted to. Pro, uh, pursue a career in clinical psychology. Okay. You know, I, I fancy myself as a counsellor. Right. And um, using my psychology background. And so that's what I was trying to do. Mm. And I tried to apply to university to do that. Right. To get some more practical experience. Mm. So I ended up working in, a, in a, actually a, a, a psychology department of a hospital in Bromsgrove. In, okay. Uh, right near, in the West Midlands. West Midlands. So right. that's what I did. I went and went to do some more, get some more experience, mm. apply again, didn't really get in, and then yeah. I'll, I'll do something more. So I got an opportunity to go back to Derby okay. after three years at university, right. and um, got a job back in Derby working in a probation hostel. Okay. So I thought it's a chance to get back home. Yeah. And um, all of a sudden, I'm looking at being trained to become a probation officer. Because, okay. Uh, and I thought I'll do that for a bit and go back and do my. Okay. But I ended up so, so having a totally different career. So that's kind of the psychology leading into more the social kind of yeah. uh, role, social work, social care, yeah. that yeah. that that sort of thing. I mean. And becoming a qualified social worker. So, uh, which I, I believe yeah. you did. So I, I don't know if you go back in time. I mean, these days we all talk about psychology as if it's always been around. But I mean, if you go back maybe two, three decades. You know, it was kind of considered a bit of a dark art, wasn't it? Yeah, Psychologists, yeah, you were, yeah. you, there was either something very wrong with you if your psychologist was involved, or there was something very wrong with the guy talking to you who yeah, was a psychologist. Yeah, yeah. Was yeah. that your experience? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's the impression. More probably to do with psychiatry than that, psychology. Right. Because psychology is more about behaviour, and yeah. uh, psychiatry is about medicine. And yeah. So um, it has got, it's, it's a bit more, less known than any other profession, because mm. typical Indians, you go for medicine, engineering, <laughs> law. And so this was. Don't forget uh, accountancy, by the way. Yeah, accountancy. The, yeah, the, 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 we, we don't want to alienate the accountants yeah. out there. <laughs> yeah, so psychology was a different area, and I think more and more people were looking at different mm. things to do, and um, it's one of those things, yeah. And, and obviously, whilst you were working you know, within that sphere of social work, I, I mean, I know most of us, uh, there's a large population out there when they hear the word social work, they kind of, you know, they get their hackles up and often I know social workers get in high profile cases get used as scapegoats when yeah. things go wrong but 99% of the time when things go right they never get the recognition yeah. uh, and so on I mean in your experience is, yeah. is that something that's pretty much yeah, the I mean, norm? I never got into the social work anyway because I'm a qualified social worker yeah. but I'm um, specialised in probation so okay. I actually work in the probation service so this is with offenders that yeah. p okay. supervising offenders okay. across uh, the board uh, so it wasn't of a particular age group or whatever no, it was It was no. offenders across the board that you mostly you um, 18 and over Okay. Se 17 to 18 and over to, I've, had, I've supervised people who were 60, 65 uh, in their late 60s. So uh, across the board, any crime, right, burglary, theft, murder. Right. How, how, long, how, long, do you, how long do you do that for? 30 years. 30 years. Yeah, That's 30 years. Uh, I was a probation officer in London for a short while. Right. Nottinghamshire most of the time, in Derbyshire. So, okay. um, but I've done all aspects of probation work, mm. working in hostels, working in prisons, right. courts, supervising people in the community. And, and for you know, a layperson like me, just trying to understand that whole idea of where that fits into the puzzle, with with kind of probation officers, you know, it's kind of. It, it, it kind of straddle the whole thing about the law and health. It yeah. kind of fits between yeah. the two pillars somehow. And it, you know, is there a logical connection there that 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 works, or are there flaws in yeah. that? 
I mean, I think any civilized society, mm. you can't actually arrest your way out of um, problems. Okay. So you can arrest people. Yeah. You can lock them up. Mm. But sooner or later, they have to come out. Right. And if you can't understand what motivates to commit crime. Right. And then you can't understand that it's problems to do with their housing. Right. Their relationships, addictions to alcohol, drugs, yeah. mental health issues, <coughs> employability. If you don't sort those out they'll continue to get into trouble, commit crime, mm. cause problems to themselves, to their families, to their society, yeah. and be a burden on the on the system. Mm. So you've got to find something else. And we know that from uh, across mm. the evidence, research has shown that. So mm. you need to do both. You need to be able to enforce mm. and punish people, but you know, then you have to give them a choice to change their lifestyle. Okay. And that's what I was really keen to do as a probation officer. And, and often that the word rehabilitation is used and it's thrown around the place and some people will say Psh, it, it, it's used, doesn't yeah. work. In your experience and, and some of this 30 years of experience so forget what people are saying, you know, did you find more often not rehabilitation was yeah. effective? I mean I think it's not a high success rate okay. but then again you're dealing with people with really difficult problems. Right. So I think if you got about twenty percent, thirty percent success rate, that's, that's you're very doing good. Well. Okay. But that is a much better outcome than mm. actually somebody just going round and mm. round in prison, out of prison, yeah. getting into addiction, getting into problems, getting into relationship difficulties. Mm. So it's not the highest success rate, but it mm. is does make a difference. And e even one person having their cha lives changed and yeah. being in control of their lives and not getting into trouble with it's the It's a win, isn't it? Is a positive outcome. Yeah. And uh, I suppose, you know, uh, like I said, a lot of people don't think it works. And they say, you know, en masse if you have the small wins in there. But sometimes it's probably quite frustrating when you've done all this work and somebody's coming out of the system back into yeah. a, an environment that, again, is kind of tough, difficult, maybe even crime-related. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it just seems a logical sort of, you know, a, a psych cycle they're going to yeah. kind of do, yeah. go back in again yeah. and then you want to deal with it and so on. That must have been pretty frustrating. It is. A lot of people can get really wound up about it yeah. and take it on board. I'm the sort of, I'm a bit more, pra I'm a bit of a pragmatist. Mm. You, you see a problem, you try to help people, yeah. but you can't beat yourself up if uh, they're, yeah. not, they're not able to sort themselves out because you've got to keep yourself sane. Yeah. and walk away and have your own life. Mm. But when you're at work, you do your best and you help people to get mm. out of the situation they're in. And most of the time, it's wider social issues. Yeah. People who get into trouble, most of them are not career professional criminals. Yeah. They're people who end up in the wrong place at the wrong time. And mm. you need, mm. they need help to mm. get out, whether it's with accommodation, mm. with education, with having <coughs> somewhere to live or just sorting out their mm. alcohol problems, yeah. their drug problems, or just having better mm. ways of relating to people. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's very easy to say I'm pragmatic, and, and clearly you are, and I'd, I'd imagine that was something you developed over time, but there must have been a point at which when you probably got into this thing, you also got quite close and emotional yeah. about this yeah. stuff. You know, yeah. you meet people, yeah. you form bond attachments, and you want this person to succeed, you want yeah. them to break this yeah. cycle. Yeah. Uh, but your hands are tied, you can only go so far with it. And I'd imagine when you've taken it to such a level, then either through their own destruction, destructive forces or circumstance, they've gone back again. That, that, that I, get, I imagine you, there was some beating up the, of yourself yeah. that must have yeah. gone with yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's disappointing. Mm. But I think for me, understanding that that can happen motivates you to keep going. Mm. Otherwise, you would give up and you get depressed yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not that sort of person. Not that person. Yeah. Well, I suppose with all that experience, 30 years and stuff, you you probably learn to kind of like yeah. put up those barriers and say, this is work, this is yeah. home, this is me. Not everybody could do that. I, yeah, I was just about to say. No, uh, no, not everybody. Lots of people got very stressed, Yeah. had difficulties, could not cope with the fact that some people couldn't work in prisons. Mm. And was it this experience you had with the, the, the social work side of it and dealing with offenders that motivated you to move into things like the Crime and Drugs um, yeah. Agency yeah. In, in, in Nottinghamshire and, yeah. and work, work yeah, in that's, that? That's part of the things. Where, uh, drugs and alcohol are two big issues that right. cause people to commit crime. So there was an opportunity to work in partnership with the wider uh, the Crime and Drugs Partnership, mm. which exists because 
the job I do as a police and crime commissioner, uh, the job I did as a police probation officer, mm. you can't do those things on your own. You have to work with all the other different agencies, local authorities, right. drug treatment and alcohol treatment <coughs> services. So the group, uh, 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 crime and drug partnership mm. was a good opportunity to work at a wider level. Right. And I was fortunate to be able to be given that job and be seconded for two years to do that. Two years to do that. Yeah. And during those two years, th were there particular initiatives that you ran around Drugs and criminality that yeah, you yeah. you kind of that we, you're proud of that actually had an effect. Yeah, yeah, I mean one of the things which is still is a big challenge. You, you've got to get to find out those people who cause the most problems. Right. What's called a frequent callers. They they are causing a problem mm. to the probation service, <coughs> to the local authorities, to the health services. Mm and they are not being helped. They get moved around from one to the other. So mm. one of the things we did was to actually have a coordinating group okay. that identified those, what they call frequent callers, right? and see who's working with them and join up the work okay. and follow them where they go rather than actually just pushing them out of your door because they cause a problem or they've broken the rules that you got. Right. So those sort of initiatives where you actually understand the complexity of the problem right. and then get partners to work together in okay. partnership. So the Crime and Drugs Partnership was exactly that, trying to get initiatives like that going. And it's in Nottingham that I worked mm. at the time. And I'm really proud of being part of joining up health services with police services and oh. the probation services and social workers and others who actually work in, in the social yeah. care background. So those sort of initiatives were really quite important. I was really pleased to be mm able to contribute to those. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like that's often one of the frustrations where you've got the disconnect between various agencies and bodies and one person's problem is kind of shunted to another yeah. person and they're starting probably from scratch yeah. again, yeah. dealing with this guy and then pushing him or her this direction and so yeah. on. And, you know, you're losing all of that continuity yeah. there and so on. So that, that's, I mean, I know it sounds simple, but because we live with people with different organ agencies, with different budgets, um, different pit personnel, probably even different locations, yeah. it probably is going to be quite difficult. So yeah. just coordinating all of that must have been quite yeah. some, an achievement. Yeah. That's pretty good. Now, you know, we talk a lot about drugs, and as soon as you talk about drugs, people are kind of like, well, yeah, you know, that's a problem. But we talk less about alcohol abuse because it seems to be kind of, well, most people have it's a legal. drink and it's legal, it's legal yeah. and people have a drink and is it really that criminal and so on. So do you think we kind of paper over the cracks about alcohol misuse and abuse? Most definitely. Yeah. Um, I'm at the moment one of the national leads for alcohol and drugs for the police and crime commissioners right. in England and Wales. One out of every six crimes right. are alcohol related. So it's a massive impact. It's about twenty billion pounds right. a year it costs society mm. as an impact <coughs> from alcohol, much greater than you'd imagine from drugs. Sure. Yeah, it's it's legal. Yeah. Everybody is able to purchase it, mm. and so majority of the population mm. uh, use it and abuse it. Mm. So it causes many problems. Mm. And uh, the campaigns that I try to do is um, things like safe night out. Right. When you go out, don't get intoxicated. Yeah. And um, if you are intoxicated, people should be mm. responsible to say no sale to you. Yeah. And so, because it does <coughs> cause a lot of problems, it causes problems in families. Yeah. It causes um, domestic abuse. Mm. And so, there are massive problems that alcohol mm. can uh, contribute to. And people turn to alcohol when they can't face their problems. Yeah. So we do need to know that, understand that, be aware of it, mm. get educated about it, and then do what we can to help mm. people get into that situation. I think, I mean, yeah, I, uh, on a personal level, uh, many years ago, uh, owned in Peter a nightclub. Yeah. So I was very close to that licensing uh, night economy yeah, yeah. where alcohol was a right to enjoy, but also alcohol could actually, the, the ugly side of alcohol was basically fights, some yeah. fairly horrendous, it turned sort of people who were quite genteel young ladies into monsters that would smash a bottle yeah. or a glass in somebody's yeah. face, uh, uh, but they wouldn't have done that without alcohol, so it was a very Jekyll and Hyde sort of yeah. thing. And, you know, I too worked with the, the local authorities there to try, try to help in that. Yeah. But, you know, often that was seen as being alcohol it's a lad culture, it's whatever, it's that sort of, you know, night out type thing. But, you know, a lot of this is happening 
in people's houses, yeah. maybe behind closed yeah. doors. So, um, and, and it's resulting in yeah. not just a abuse, but also huge burden on the health yeah. services, yeah. Um, uh, you know, breaking up houses and homes and stuff and so yeah. on. Um, and, you know, what more do you think should be done to try to yeah. combat this? I know in Scotland recently, they've actually introduced a minimum pricing for unit, unit price, alcohol, yeah. unit yeah. price. Yeah. Do you think that's something we should do in, in, I mean, in England? I, I was asked that question only a few days ago. When, when, when sorry, to, sorry, sorry, it's not original, but go on, <laughs> I'll ask it I was to. asked that question and I said, what they're trying to do in Scotland is worth looking at okay. and see what impact it will have. Okay. However, <coughs> by itself, it won't do it. Sure. Because um, what it will do is that people, if you're trying to deter people from drinking, mm. people who can afford it will continue to purchase it because as you say a lot of yeah. alcohol damage is done in the home yeah middle class people probably drink more than the people who cause trouble mm. most of the time the people who are less able to fund their drinking habits with the you know less money they will probably turn to other ways of accessing alcohol mm. if it's going to be done it's going to be done with other mm. other initiatives you've got to um, educate make aware mm. And it may not have the impact that's planned to have, mm. but I'll be watching with interest. What and if it works in Scotland, it's worth looking. One of the questions I was asked because I'm the national lead yeah. for alcohol and drugs <coughs> for the, <coughs> and client, the Association of Police and Client Commissioners. Mm. So I'll be wanting to show leadership to say, well, okay, do we do that in, in England and Wales? All right. And that's something that I'll watch with interest. But it won't. I don't think it will work by itself. No. You have to have a whole a lot of other initiatives yeah. that focus on yeah. the home, yeah. education and awareness mm. and the impact the alcohol can have physically mm. but also socially and emotionally to people and their yeah. families and the society. Yeah. And, and, and even to do with things like, I mean I, I must admit I've uh, actually had the misfortune over the last few weeks, thankfully it's nothing serious, to end up in A&E with, with kids, with a mum um, yeah. and even myself at one point. And, um, you know the number of people in an A and E who are intoxicated. They're drunk. Yeah. They're, you know they are injured. They're hurt, yeah. but they are drunk. It, it's it's a theme that's there. Yeah. It's apparent because you've got the sober people who are injured, uh, and then you've got the drunk people that are injured. And you know, is there again just like the minimum pricing of alcohol should maybe there be the thing that says hold hold on a second. If this is self inflicted, and you're coming to hospital using these resources, you should actually be paying for them. Yeah. yeah. yeah? That is a big question, it's a moral question, but in this country, mm. I, I think it's, it could be dangerous because uh, sometimes people don't know when they're going to get into that situation, mm. whether they get into alcohol. The reasons people start drinking are many. Of course. So having a moralistic position on it is a bit dangerous because, okay, if you do it for alcohol, what else do you do it for? Sure. You know, if somebody eats too much. much yeah, there is you know, that point. Yeah. Obese, well, you say, sorry, you, you know, sure. It's self-inflicted, yeah. yeah. So, so I think I think sort of a, there's a moral dilemma on this. Mm. So I would not be in favour of saying, oh, because somebody's uh, got themselves into a drunken state, mm. they shouldn't be helped. I think it's more a question of raising awareness and stopping, preventing people from mm. getting into that situation. But I mean, is again and uh, the, uh, the medical ethics say they will they will try to save life. Yeah. Whatever it is. It'll be a major change in our legislative yeah. outlook to change all that. But wouldn't there be something, and again, you know, it's a tough one. You don't want to be kind of like a big brother society, but isn't there something to be fair to all? You know, if one person or, or set of people, and again, it doesn't matter whether it's to do with alcohol or, or obesity, and I, you know, my own personal background was I, I've come from a, a, a morbidly obese situation to a much healthier situation by paying for it myself, but I, I, I came to terms with that. You know, if you've got people that are draining resource, and I don't just mean the one-off, yeah. but they're in there every couple of weeks yeah. because, you know, I, I just happened to go on a bender this weekend, as I did two weekends ago and a weekend before that. You know, should there not be somebody that comes along and says, hang on a second, look, it's John here. John is always doing yeah. this. Yeah. Let's offer John the help. And if John doesn't want the help, then John might have to pay for this thing, yeah. you know, because yeah. John is draining yeah. all of this resource. Yeah. I mean, might that be an option? Yes, but from my experience, the guy who's coming back Every, the Johnny who's coming back all the time mm. will probably has, hasn't got any money. Uh, he, well, okay, we'll yeah. Be able to, and you probably say, okay, if you can't pay, we're going to put you in prison. Yeah. And uh, for a day or yeah. for ten days or for a year, sooner or later they yeah. will come out. So, 
it's not always easy. If, if there's financial means, that's yeah. an easy way. Yeah. But those people will get stopped anyway because, uh, you know, uh, but the people who get into that, that low in life, yeah. that they lost most things and they keep coming back, yeah. they won't, you won't be able to impose that on those yeah. people because uh, they just won't be in a position to pay yeah. any financial penalties. If you lock them up, sooner or later they're going to come out. Our prisons are already mm. 82 thousand people mm. in our prisons mm. it's the largest per thousand population wow. prison population in in the world well, i think right body america right and it, it doesn't necessarily mean you end up having less crime yeah. and less problems because 70 mm. percent of the people who are in there mm. they're not in there because they're willfully wanting to break the law they're yeah. in there because they got social emotional mm. practical problems which they can't deal with mm. No, I do t I take your point about the not being able to pay for it. I actually watched the guy trying to get the nurses to pay for his taxi home, and he was drunk. So I think they actually had a whip around. Whip round. I actually <laughs> put some money in there just to get the guy out because he was so obnoxious yeah. out of any. Yeah. So just talk. You, you also got involved in politics as a councillor. Yeah. So um, you know, what was the drive behind that? Was it uh, trying to do something more for the community, or was it just something you want to explore because yeah. you're you're a very politically per political person? Um, initially, mm. my father was a local council. Oh, okay. For me, he was a bit of a community activist and a worker. So when I was growing up, right, 1973, he oh. became one of the first councillors, um, probably Indian ethnic minority councillors okay. in the country, I, I would guess. Okay. And, um, so he started getting involved and um, I used to watch him work and I thought, I saw a lot of problems with society mm. that came to him to help. Yeah. And I just wondered, you know, he'd be interested in that. In fact, that's what led to me thinking about psychology as a oh okay as a as an input to was a problem trying people to understand have. human behaviour Be okay and seeing people okay in, in a, not just Indians but all walks of life, all society backgrounds, really in difficulties either mm. through injustice or because of the problems they were or lack of education. So I saw him doing a lot of good work. Right, and he was a politician, and of course uh, when there's elections, he was. Um, I wouldn't say encouraging, but sort of expecting that I'd be helping out. So, uh, I, I yeah, yeah, a good son, you've got yeah. to do that. Come on, yeah. come on. Well, you know what it's like. So, so were you campaigning? Uh, were you out there knocking doors and stuff? Knocking doors, and when I was at university, you say, "Oh, you're you're going to come back. I've got an election." So, getting back even from university, back yeah. 150 miles well. away, <laughs> back back to you're Derby. not back yet. Get yeah. back here, yeah. Back to Derby to help out. So. You could say I got the bug yeah. doing that, and um, but I always felt no, I don't want to do local party because he was a local council. I'd imagine, yeah. And I thought no, I'll, if I want to go into, I'll go at a higher level. You know, yeah. uh, old man's done that. I don't want to do uh, that. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I thought I'll go for. I had aspirations. Um, Nothing wrong with those. For a bit higher parliamentary. Right. But um, in the end, I thought well, give it a go. Uh, test it out at a local level. Level. So, uh, but I never stopped working. Okay. I always worked full time, uh, sort of um, as a in the probation yeah. service, and um, it's uh, because local politics is is a hobby more than a well, it's becoming more than that now. Right. It was something it that was you did. It was at the time. Okay. And very few people were working full time yeah. and doing that, but I managed to do that. Yeah. Well, so I used to. I, used to got interested that way, I mean, to be fair, I used to knock a few doors myself, but I used to run away after doing it. So <laughs> sorry, Mrs. Jones, that was that was me. So, um, just when you, whilst you were a councillor, you know, what the, what was the kind of best thing with it, about doing that sort of thing? Did you do you feel that you were making a difference? What, yeah, what? I mean, sometimes it is difficult because um, local government is dictated by more and more by central government in terms of the funds you get, right. what you can and can't do. However. I did have great satisfaction in representing the, the people I did, mm. and sort of some people who are in difficult situations. Right. And if, it's, if they can be improved by council services, by better services, better housing um, support, then that's really good. So I was really pleased to mm. make a difference to people's lives. Uh, at the level I could, and then also to try to shape the uh, policies and the direction of uh, Derby City Council. Because you know, I did that as a mm. cabinet member for education <coughs> and lifelong learning, trying to improve education and attainment mm. in Derby. Okay. I did it as um, uh, I was in charge of social care, okay. adult and social care and health portfolio. So mm. trying to really work in people who've got problems 
disability, mental health issues. No. So doing those sort of things was uh, mm. quite good. But of course, enjoyed things like when I became the leisure and culture mm. cabinet member. Oh, okay. Finding out about social mm. life and high society. That so was good as well. Uh, is there high society in Derby? And where is it? Where can I find um, it? I would like to say. This was. There is. Uh, well, there's good people in Derby. Th th I'm sure there are, and you're not going to say anything Derby's else. Got, uh, it, 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 I'm sure it's gonna, they're the best people. So just coming back to the police and crime commissioner, you were obviously in the deputy role as police yeah. and crime commissioner before you moved into the big shoes yeah. um, so I guess you know we understand that you what you don't do is have a light on the roof and you're, you're trying to do yeah. that I'm working but on that one. you're working on that one you keep yeah. telling us that which we're, I'm gonna make a note of that and I'm gonna check with you but so just for those of us that don't know too much about the the, the, the police crime commissioner role yeah. what what does a police crime commissioner do right um, it is governance and oversight. So okay. what, what police and crime commissioners do is what uh, what's what police authorities did before. Okay. There was a committee of 17 people. Right. Um, mostly politicians, did local politicians. Did they ever agree on anything, 17 Not people? Not very often. I didn't think so. And if right. I, I did that, I was a member. I was a city council representative of Derbyshire Police Authority for okay. 10 years. So right. I know that side of the work. Right. And so their job was, as a, as a committee, to oversee the work of the police in Derbyshire. Right. And so you allocate the money, set the policies, and then hold the chief constable mm. to account in terms of how they deliver to the people of Derbyshire. Mm. So that was got rid of by the government because they th thought they were faceless, not accountable to the public, and they brought in one person who was elected by the people of Derbyshire. So that's what police and crime commissioners get. They get elected for four years, mm. and then they have to if they want to be continue, they have to stand again for election. Right. Yeah. So it's the people of Derbyshire who vote. Right. And then the person who gets voted, their job is to get the money from government and from council tax. Right. So when everybody pays their council tax, small amount of that is for policing. Right. And it's my job to set that precept. Okay. To get the money, which is a third of the f for money I get for policing in Derbyshire. Okay. So can I just ask? Because when, when I mean, do you? go and say, look, I, in order to run the police force efficiently, I need X amount, yeah. um, and that's the budget that's set. Do, are you finding at the moment you're getting anywhere close to the budget you want or not? No, no. In <laughs> fact, I've been on a campaign all summer okay. with the Chief Constable of Derbyshire, and every police and crime commissioner across the country is doing the same. Same thing. We're talking to government saying, look, austerity or whatever it is, mm. you are not paying enough money so for example we are getting 1.3 percent less per right. year than we need so we gotta you make got savings right. make cuts and uh, we're saying to them no so and it's been happening for the last eight years we've got where, where do the cuts tend to where, where, what's the kind of where does well, the knife tend to go in people are the police are 80 percent is people yeah you know so that's pe so it's a people cut generally not head, head count police community support officers Police staff, none the uniformed who actually support the IT okay. people, the forensic people, the the uh, the administ the accountants, the finance people. Mm. They're all people who are the what's called the policing family. Mm. So they all we've had 370, 380 less police officers right. now than in eight years ago. Right. 26 wow. less police community support officers now than eight years ago. And more crime than eight years ago. Crime was going down right until about the last couple of years. Okay. Recorded crime. Okay. But it's coming up. Okay. And um, plus new crimes are coming up. Cyber crime. Right. Fraud. Online fraud in particular. Yeah. Uh, you know, people I don't know, people get lots of what's called phishing emails. I, I, I know. You I've know? wondered like during lottery somebody so sending, many times. Somebody it's amazing. sending in another country. Yep. Sending just pressing a button, going to millions of people. Yeah. And if even if one or two of them respond, yeah. with the sad story saying yeah. I, I need some money or yeah. or you've won a million pounds, all you gotta do is give me your details yeah, exactly. and we'll send you the money. Yeah. And they get the details and they access your account. As, as somebody who works in IT, I can tell you there probably isn't even a person sitting there doing that now. It's probably a Autobot or a yeah. chatbot that's yeah. doing it. It's, it's an automatic program that actually does that on a time basis. Yeah. So, so r traditional crime is either steady or slightly going down, slightly coming up. Mm. But there's new crime. So mm. nearly fifty percent now is cyber, yeah. naval or cyber mm. related mm. crime, and you need different 
Skill resources, sets, yeah. different mm. types of people. Mm. So rather than having a police officer in a uniform walking the streets mm. where you and I sitting at home say, oh, we feel secure, mm. but they're not going to help your daughter mm. or your son on the computer and somebody pretending to be young like them yeah. and telling them, don't tell your parents. Yeah, and grooming them or doing something. Grooming them yeah. and then meeting them and uh, abusing them yeah. or killing them, yeah. which has happened. Yeah. That for that you need somebody in their jeans and t-shirts mm. sitting behind a computer chasing criminals. Mm. So that's the new world, mm. and uh, I'm trying to con convey to the government that the money shouldn't go down; it should go up. Finally. Yeah, because my point was going to be very much along the lines of there is so much emphasis put on catching the criminal, doing all of that, and somewhere along the line you often think there was a victim here that got forgot about. They you know, their idea was this guy, you know, got to court, he either got, you know, t uh, you know, a suspended sentence or he got jailed or whatever it is. But, and, you know, they're forgotten about and so on. So, in a way, what you're saying there is there is a... a I mean, there's still a challenge. So, I commissioned mm. those services. I've got young people's service as well. I mean, young people mm. who are victims don't tend to access services, so I'm trying to change that. Right. But I'm still concerned, and I think most people are, that our system is a bit... So crimes committed, mm. the victim is um, acknowledged but probably not yeah. paid attention to and the system takes <coughs> over in doing something with the offender. Mm. And we sometimes leave the victim to one side mm. as if they're going to look after themselves. So I'm working hard to change that so that we involve the victims more, mm. what they feel has happened to them and what they might want to, mm. you know, to know more about what, the, what happened to the mm. offender needs to be improved and there's too many people out there who are victims who don't ask for help, help and suffer in silence. Mm. Can I just, just pick on, that, on that point, can I say, is there more propensity for quiet victims to come from certain backgrounds or, or cultures? Uh, you know, I'm just thinking more now from an Indian Asian yeah, culture yeah. Back, or background where it's a case of if I tell people I was a victim, if the stigma's with me, if I ask for help, yeah. it's because I'm weak and yeah. I'm, I'm just, you know, uh, opening a can of worms here, so best just to sh yeah. keep quiet and do nothing. Yeah. I think it's, it is across all communities, mm. but I think uh, ethnic minority and Indian communities probably more. Right. Particularly if you think of things like domestic abuse. Right. Massive. It's a, it's a challenge anyway in any society, mm. but I think um, still, uh, it's improve, improving in my opinion, but it still is a big issue that if there's domestic abuse, mm. you feel shame, you mm. don't want it to become public, yeah. you try to keep it in the family, and mm. that doesn't actually help the victim, no. and it doesn't actually have challenge the perpetrator. Mm. So there's a lot of work to be done around that. There's mm. forced marriage yeah. is a major <coughs> issue, it still is. And uh, how to actually make mm. sure that one people understand that they are mm. being forced to do things because yeah, you know, we're all very can be all very persuasive well, in families, and then if they are, how mm. they get help. Mm. So there are it is an issue. It's an issue across the whole mm. of society. Yeah, but in particular areas, it's communities. People, it, our it, community, we, we need well, we know that certainly within more in Asian culture, the idea of forced marriage and honour. Is the big thing that is that you yeah, know you, right. you've got to do this, so you've got to marry this person, or you've got to do this, or you must suffer in silence from the abuse point, which is, you know, that and sadly, and I hate to say this, that sort of there's quite a backward rhetoric. Uh, I have actually heard cases yeah. where uh, a mother, a, a mother who's abused, has actually said to her daughter or daughter-in-law, "I went through it, so yeah. I got through, so yeah. just just accept That's it. Right. It's norm," That's which right. really isn't a great logic to use, but yeah. sadly, it's yeah. still used. So there's a lot of work. That needs to be done. Yeah. I, do, I try to do that. I, can't, I do it directly myself by going out and giving talks. Okay. But I also, the, any provider I commission to do the services, I expect them mm. to go out and reach out into communities, mm. engage with all the different communities, look to the ones where less referrals are coming through and work with them to increase mm. that. Okay. So uh, just in terms of recently, there was um, a survey in The Guardian about the most influential black Asian minority ethnic people yeah. and you made that list you made the cut I know, you know I mean, they, 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 they missed me yeah. out totally I can't believe why uh, but there you go that I, that's maybe because I don't read the Guardian <laughs> so uh, what was your reaction to actually seeing that 
Well, I, 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 was, um, I was very surprised. I said, I said are you sure? Was there yeah. somebody else with the same name as me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I was very surprised, but when it sort of dawned on me that they, they have done a fairly extensive survey. They had indeed, and yes. And out of the top 1,000 most influential people, I think they were saying. Mm, um, it was, those. it was, yeah. And I thought, really? Yeah. And, uh, but then I thought, well, uh, I'm very we, proud. Well, you think these other 999 must oh, be no. doing nothing. Yeah. <laughs> but then you also, it does make you th wonder. Yeah. Why aren't there more? And that, that, was, that was the piece, actually. Yes. Ethnic minorities were still, in relation to the population, they were still... Yeah, a thousand's not a big number, is it? A thousand is a big number when you yeah. think about... No, it yeah. was a thousand, yeah. Th it's but out of the note, it was a, a, a thousand most pop, pop uh, influential people in this country. Country, yeah. Across the but, board. But the number that were actually from black. Only three percent, I think, were yeah, exactly. from so the, the yeah. age, um, ethnic minority, minority background. So yeah, that's, that's not a big number. So and I think seven yeah. or something were seven or six. Yes, yeah. in, in there, which is, you know, it's, it's nice. I mean, these things are all pretty good. I mean. You know, again, it's one of the reasons that's kind of brought us to talk to you because, again, the idea is that you know we do want to show that it, the people from different backgrounds, yeah. regardless, uh, can make a difference, can do good things, um, uh, and and clearly that's that that's something you're you're, you're doing a lot of. Now, uh, let me ask you a question. I mean, you, you still have that kind of con connection to India. Do you ever, or have you got this? Uh, is there a connection with the police? in India and, and advising them or talking to them or whatever? Funny you should say that. One of the first things I thought about doing, and I did go um, last year to India. All right. Um, it was not just a holiday. I thought, um, I thought, is, is this, this could be a great opportunity for me mm. to see whether I can connect up yeah. with the police in the Punjab and India. Right. And to see whether there's something <coughs> we can learn from each mm. other in terms of practice, <coughs> policies. <coughs> So I went um, with my friend, uh, my fellow councillor, actually, Bobby Sambu from mm. uh, Derby um, City Council. We went and uh, I met with the uh, uh, Director General of the Punjab Police, right. the Haryana Police, okay. and then the local Punjab uh, Jalandhar District Police mm. to see what, what sort of things are they doing and whether they'd be interested in sort of having more, more sort of communication. Right. and see whether there's potential areas where we could actually learn from each other. So I did that mm. and there was a positive response and in fact I also met uh, with the National Law University which is in right. Delhi to see whether I can connect them up with the Derby University mm. around um, law, policing and uh, victims work. Mm. So again whether we can have an exchange. Mm. So I'm really interested in doing that. So I went and there was some positive responses mm. from the uh, director generals there, but it was with, uh, just coming up to an election in the Punjab. Right. And uh, <laughs> they weren't sure whether they'd be... <laughs> they'd be there next time round, yeah. Be, so, but they were still positive. They sort of made, uh, uh, said name, game names as well. Even if we're not there, these people will be mm. here. So I am thinking about talking to uh, okay. our chief constable to see how we can have exchanges mm. and we'll share policy. Okay. Or procurement, because for example, mm. I don't know if you heard of a, an, uh, automatic number plate recognition. Yep, but yep. I've been copped loads of times. Haryana, no, no, Haryana yeah. Police, yeah. nearly everybody, I think. <laughs> Haryana Police um, yeah. had tried to procure a system. From okay, a if you know a system. Uh, right, and they okay. They weren't too. Okay. They weren't sort of uh, very um, positive about that particular thing. So I said, look, I'll try to mm. do that. And it reminds me, I've got to sort of see whether I can get our people here right. it up to see whether we can get a contract in India. Oh, that's on not a bad game, is it? Yeah, that's pretty good. So, and other things, you know, mm. that, is, that is potential mm. to have exchange, yeah. to learn different ways of policing. Yeah. And uh, I'm really keen to see if I can okay. uh, try to do that. Just be careful if you you mess with the Russians, they will hack your APNR system and yes. actually change all the number plates. So you, you, you know you'll get loads of fines. So just very quickly, I'm mindful of a bit of time here and stuff. So you obviously have a very very full life, um, and so when you're kind of away from this, what do you do to kind of like relax and switch off? Um, my wife would say, I never switch off. No, well, I'm not asking your wife, I'm asking you. <laughs> but no, I, I, I'm a Derby County supporter, okay. season ticket holder. Okay. Go to so is that a happy experience at the moment? So I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not following uh, it. Uh, yes, uh, Derby County, for the last few years, are uh, giving us... Uh, sleepless night, sleepless night? Exercising us fans. Okay. We're a very loyal fan base, uh, you know, one of the best um, attended um, 
clubs we are. Right. And we, we, we get better attendance than some of the Premier League teams. But so, but then we're still struggling to get get sort of consistency and move right. on. So I, I've, I've sort of follow football, watch okay. football. Okay. I did ask you what you did to relax, but that sounds like even more stress to me. Right. But so. Y y and um, go on holidays, but mostly uh, I, I like sort of um, reading history. Okay. History is something, uh, particularly ancient history. Okay. I've sort of got an affinity to Greek, Roman. And even you know uh, Punjabi history. Okay. You know, uh, really quite interested in that. So I read a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, just generally um, spend time with family and um, go out. I'm a grandfather now, so um, I try to uh, same here. Yeah, try it's always try good. to get a chance to be with my grandchildren. Not always possible because you know. Sure. Sure. I try my best to do that. What about things like music? Is, is that something that's big in your life, or are you not? Not a, that big. Not no. that big. Uh, I, I like listening to music, but I'm not the one sort of. A, if I have to s turn the button on the radio, it's, right. uh, it's probably on the current well, affairs. What, 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 what music. It is. I was going to ask you what you tasted music was. Whether it was kind of like more Indian traditional or is it Western I'm, music. I'm a mix. Sort of. Uh, as I say, uh, nine years old, nine and a half years old when I came here. Yeah. Um, if somebody looked at me uh, from the Indian eyes, they said, "Oh, he's a bit too modern to be uh, an Indian." If they looked at me from the English eyes, they said, "Oh, he's a he's a bit Indian." So I'm a, I'm a bit of a mix. So Somewhere I've been called a coconut as well, but there yeah. you go. So so, uh, so I um, I like um, the Eagles. Oh and, um, yes, okay. You know uh, the Beatles and um, you know uh, yeah uh, that sort of um, yeah. So just just uh, just just you know, I I, I my, my flag is for now firmly to Western music. I, I grew up doing uh, being a DJ yeah. and stuff and doing that. Yeah. So the Eagles, Beatles, Pink Floyd, yeah. bands of that. A, yeah. a genre plus modern stuff I yeah. like and so on is good so it's interesting now but I just I was trying to visualize you maybe doing a bit of Bhangra and stuff but yeah. is that not you? I've been known to invite oh, my have. family. Uh, no I, do, I do that but not with music I do it all the time yeah <laughs> particularly in shops yeah. yeah. But, uh, uh, that's so now but uh, you know um, I used to sort of get up and sort of uh, make a fool of myself. Oh, it's got to be done sometimes. Yeah. Got to be done. What about what about things like do you do you get to do much in the way of watching movies, cinema, that sort of stuff, and anything not you as like? Much. There? Uh, we try to sometimes go out, not that often. Mostly English, I have to say. You, yeah, um, I, hang on a second. Did you not talk to me earlier on about the Justice League? Justice DC? League. Because yeah. you used to read the comics, the DC yeah, comics. Yeah, I read the DC comics so and the Marvel, Marvel comics. comics. Yeah. So, are you, are you a fan of the movies? Yeah. Well, I've seen probably nearly all the Marvel okay. films. Okay. Justice League as a DC. Uh, yeah, film. Well, yeah. So okay. I, I think I want to go to see it, but the review I heard recently was not good, so I might wait, wait for it to come on uh, television. Yeah. But I do if I can go out. You're not going to go get one of those illegal set-top boxes. Oh, you can't say that. <laughs> Download it. No. So yeah. So yeah. I like going to the cinema. Don't get a chance to do that often. Okay. So I, I do sort of tend to stick to work too much, but I. Yeah. Marvel, any any Marvel, I, I think Marvel hero. If it's on a film, I'll it, watch it. You'll watch it. That's, yeah. that's, that's, there you go. Uh, you see, you definitely need to get that light sorted upstairs, Commissioner Gore. Sorry, Commissioner didn't say. You really do. I can see where this is going. You see, yeah. this is it. And uh, what about you, you, when it comes to things like sort of um, you know food and cooking and stuff? Are you are you a dab hand in the kitchen, or do you just like try to eat and let somebody else do I'd, it? I'd prefer to eat. When the food is made, but, but I have been known to do cooking, and uh, you know the only thing I don't do is make uh, chapatis, but I can cook just about every. Yeah, every that, up, food. that up is tough, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not not easy, do not it? Uh, but so yeah. I've not I've not done chapatis roti. Yeah. But uh, meat cooking, uh, keema, chicken, lamb, do all that. Vets, gobi, alu gobi, I can do. But so you can give. is a bit more. I, I tend not to go for dala. You, you make them myself. But yeah. Uh, most food, yeah. yeah. Don't do it very often, mind you. I, I, I uh, bet when your wife watches, she's going to say, that's rubbish. He never does any of this. He never does this. He's just doing often. that for the cameras. Not very often. He just that cameras. Yeah. <laughs> that's brilliant. Uh, Adil, just, um, we're, just, we're probably running out of time. Yeah. One of the things I, I mentioned to you, and I know um, easily, I could easily ask you, you know, people that have influenced you, that mentors, that people that you thought a lot of. Now, one of the things I often ask my guests is if you were having a dinner party, because all that talk of food's made me hungry, we're sitting around a table. Yeah, so if, 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 you, if, you, if you had a chance to get three people around a table, any three people from history, past, living or dead, yeah. not family though, I know you've got, you know, so you've got to get out a jail card to get your, your, yeah. your parents or, or your wife or anybody else yeah. involved. Just people that you would, who would you kind of want to break bread with and, and why would you want them around the right. table with you? I think the first one would mm. be Maharaja Ranjit Singh. Okay. Yeah. Because he was a 
for, 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 for one, he was the only ruler that mm. probably had uh, managed to unite the Indians, the Muslims, and uh, probably every other okay. to form a nation. So he was a unifier? He was a unifier, but a very clever unifier. And he probably had 40 years of rule mm. in the Punjab as a nation. Okay. And it took 10 years mm. for it to all dissolve after his death. Right. So to me, that tells us that he had to be pretty clever, mm. good uh, sort of diplomat. Yeah, very. And uh, able to use uh, harness mm. resources that mm. he had to mm. create something like that. Okay. Sort of, uh, so Maharaj Singh is yeah. at okay. the top. Who, In who, fact, who, I sort of go uh, got, uh, got my dad to name my older sister. Okay. After him. After because, him. Uh, when I was young, I read about him and I was okay. really impressed. Ah, and it's something that we should look to see, to see mm. how, how he did that mm. so others can follow. Okay. And who, who else? Who are the other two? Who the chairs would f fill the other two chairs? Um, Dr. Ambedkar, no. for Indian, you know, the D social reformer, campaigner right. for equality. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, he wrote the Constitution uh, for India. Yeah, he did indeed, yes. And uh, he was a uh, um, promoter of equality for the untouchables and women. Right. And I, that's close to my heart in terms of, you know, people. There's a lot of inequality in this world, a lot of discrimination. And, and he okay. did a lot of work. And he was from the untouchable community himself. Yeah, okay went to a very uh, uh, academically and uh, politically, socially, he went to a high place. And uh, he, I think he, was con he contributed quite strongly to the writing of the Indian constitution. Mm. Uh, but a very social reformer and campaigner. Mm. Sadly, large parts of that constitution seem to get forgotten about these I days. Know, so, that, but he wrote, it, he wrote it. He wrote it. Like it's say, difficult if, to if make politicians it. come along and yeah. tend to choose, pick and choose what they want. And out that's of a shame. But which is, it is. It but he, he did. Yeah. yeah. No, that's understandable. And, and and your third choice would be. As I say, I go back into history. Yeah, go, go into history. Yeah, it yeah. sounds like it yeah. is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, I'd, I'd sort of uh, it was a toss up between Ashoka. Okay. Yeah. Who was. Before Christ, you know, he he was he was the the uh, the symbol in the flag, Indian flag, the uh, Ashoka. Uh, yeah, that's based on his symbol. And okay, he, and he was a ruler of India. Okay. But I think I'll go for Akbar, Akbar the Great. Okay, uh, because India is a mix of many different backgrounds, mm. and Akbar was the Mughal ruler mm. who actually united India. Mm -hmm. He was tolerant of all mm. different religions, and he united India into one nation. Uh, right. After the turmoils of mm. the, um, the the uh, the British rule, well, the British came after mm. that, but all the sort of turmoils that happened in India mm. when they were separate states, mm. he produced that. Mm. And uh, I remember going to um, uh, when I w uh, ten, fifteen years ago, went to India, mm. and there's a place where where he's buried, the mausoleum, mm. and when you the people still go there, visiting, mm. and you go into this place, it's fairly eerie, it's no. very quiet. Mm. Um, so you know, he, he, so Akbar, Akbar the Great. So you'd have a very kind of Indian table. Just you obviously won't be serving pie and chips as your main course, I no, guess. No, no probably. And 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 uh, no dinner party is complete without somebody doing the washing up. So who who would be pickers of uh, somebody less favourable in your eyes to to kind yeah. of do the dishes? No, I think I think if I was in a dinner party with those three guys, yeah. I'd have to do the dishes. No, no, that's a cop out. No, 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 no. <laughs> they, they wouldn't let you. Come on, there's got to be a villain. There's got to be somebody out there that in, from history that you'd, you'd probably want to sort of like clean up. Yeah, uh, well, for, uh, it can't be. It would have to be from wider than India. It, it could be. It could. It can be anywhere. It can be from anywhere. It can be yeah. from Basingstoke. Yeah. I don't mind. So <laughs> just, just you know. I reckon. Um, Adolf Hitler. Hitler, yeah, yeah. Hitler's always I mean, a good. I'd get him to do the dishes. Hitler's a good choice, along with Nigel Farage yeah. and Donald Trump. So there you go. That, yeah, that, particularly that, since that, that's recently, brilliant. Hate Crime Week, I went down to uh, London. Yeah. To speak to the uh, Jewish community mm. because the anti-Semitism is it's on really the rise. Yeah. Again. So uh, I wanted to go down to see how mm. they experienced it. Met with some Holocaust survivors. Survivors, that would be quite uh, something. That sort of reminded me of that. Yeah. That period. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we're just going to finish off with um, something. It's. Um, if all of that's been far too serious, as you'd imagine, um, this is this is the kind of like uh, less serious bit. Yeah. This is fishbowl, where right. I'm going to ask you just to. It's a kind of self inquisition. There's some kind of questions on this paper right. spaghetti. I'd like to pick uh, a question, okay. uh, read it out, and uh, answer it honestly, which I'd expect you would do as the yeah. commissioner. Yes. And I apologise if the writing's so small. Have you ever parked in a family? Uh, 
Have you ever parked in a family with children spot and you've got no kids in the car? <laughs> you know, it's supermarkets. No, no, oh, come on. I've thought about it, but I haven't done it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I'm guilty. I did that once. And a woman did pull, pull me up and she goes, have you got any kids? I said, yeah, I have. They're about 19 and 20. They're at home. Uh, and I drove off. It was on the way out. So, so yeah, go on. Then. I did say these are a bit bizarre. Okay, here we go. If you could teach a college course on any subject you want, what would it be? Uh, I'd say it'd be um, psychology. Psychology. Yeah. So. That's, that was an easy that's, one. That's like a busman's <laughs> holiday, isn't it? <laughs> right, here we go. What part of your body would you replace with a mechanical version? My knees. This I've got really keeps coming up, actually. I think I, there must be more than one of those in there. But I, I yeah, think, I think I need I need two. Two. Uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I'm putting it off as long as I can. It can. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> We're a couple more of those. So let's see if we can get something that's maybe. There we go. Your favourite funny film. Wow, well, there you go. It's got to be the Laurel and Hardy ones from going back and from. Uh, and were, nothing wrong with that, brilliant. I tell you, they, my, they, my they dad and myself, we used to sit there laughing our heads off with yeah. black and white. Laurel well, and Hardy I, films. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I mean, I, I love Laurel and Hardy. I, I love all my comedy yeah. and stuff. The Marx Brothers, Laurel and Hardy. We used yeah. to fight over Christmas because yeah. I used to want to watch those and then somebody else would want to watch something else. But just talking of, of dads, I mean, you know, my dad wasn't one of those guys that used to laugh a lot, but there was one film he watched. And it was a one clip of a film that he watched, one scene in a film he watched, Blazing Saddles, yeah. where they're all around the campfire eating beans and then breaking oh, wind. Yeah, yeah. And I, he was, he laughed so much, he was in tears at that. And I, well, that was an abiding memory. And when I watch that film, it just reminds me of my late yeah, father. No, that is funny. That is a funny film as well, Blazing Saddles. If you receive poor service, do you keep quiet or do you complain? I complain. Brilliant. I complain. Good, good. Good for you, good for you. Look, we'll do one more of those, one more of those, go on. Let's see if we can get a stranger. Oh, you got two, oh, two doesn't both, right. yeah, there you go. Okay. You could be your own superhero. Uh, what, would, what would be your ideal superpower? There you go, how relevant hey? is that for a Marvel I man? Know, I know, Marvel. Uh, yeah, you, you picked I, it. I reckon uh, telepathy. Telepathy? Telepathy. I don't know what you're thinking. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look into my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? Yeah, go. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favourite celebrity and why? Oh, right. Um, I think Gary Lineker. Gary Lineker. Yeah, because uh, okay, he's somebody who um, was a good player, mm -hmm. and I was really surprised that he was taken on as a sports commentator mm -hmm. and anchorman for uh, yeah. match of the day originally, wasn't yeah. it? And, uh, he's come on. But I was really impressed, and he has, you know, grown in the job, mm. and he's he's made it his own. Yeah. So I'm really impressed in terms of how, yeah. from what I expected to what he actually turned up. As that's a that's a fa yeah. fair point. That's right. The old thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you tonight. It's uh, I, I hopefully it's not been too traumatic for you, no. um, and um, again we, we look forward to uh, having some more banter with you another Definitely. time. Thank you very much. It's been really good. Thank you. We trust you enjoyed it this evening. Look forward to tuning in again. In the meantime, take care. Wagaju Kalsa, Wagaju Fatih. Good night. My guest next week will be Gilamjeet Singh, who's head of NHS Trust in Leicester.